Hey everybody, welcome to the Songtown Studio. We got Rivers Rutherford as our special guest tonight. Rivers is an old friend and co-writer. We've written a good number of songs together. Um, and he's one of the most talented singer songwriter people I've ever met. Well, thank you. You're welcome. That's a kind comment. Um, and I didn't know. So you know, when we co-write, we don't usually do a whole lot of research on each other. But <laughs> since I was going to interview you, I, I did some research on you today, and read that you grew up three blocks from Graceland. Is yes, that correct. Yeah, about four, but yeah, mm -hmm. sure did. Three, yeah. four. Well, see, they lied on that. Yeah, well, <laughs> they always exaggerate on this. Well, I, it was probably me. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, sure did. We we uh, I, I can. My dad was 16 when Elvis bought Graceland, really? and, uh, and he lived uh, next door. And it, it was a, it was a little house, but he lived next door to Graceland. And uh, so my my grandmother and grandfather kind of got to know the Presleys a little bit, and my dad, you know, just by being around. And I remember in probably 1971, I would have been three or four years old. We were riding down Highway 50, well, that was Presley Boulevard, and. Uh, and my dad said, "There's Elvis," and he pulled over, and, and it was uh, all I remember is he had jet black hair, and he had on a blue shirt, and he was on a white horse, and we got to talk to him from that. Oh, really? Was he in his yard? Or yeah, where he was, was yeah, he was just riding a horse around. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. The horse was looking back over; he kept nibbling it. That was his leg, kind of biting mm -hmm. at him, you know. And uh, Elvis was like, "Horse, quit nibbling my leg." I, I remember that. I don't know why. <laughs> Hey, I was like, Glenn Rutherford, this is my, my son, Rivers, you know, and he said, hey, how you doing, son? You know, that old deal. Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your songwriting process, because I think everybody watching this are songwriters, so I know they're going to want to hear kind of, I mean, what's your thought process going into it, to a co-write of how, how you approach writing a song? Man, you know, I've been asked that question a bunch, and uh, I, I can give you answers. I, I don't know. It, 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 I mean, there's some things that are kind of common, but they're not rules by any stretch of the imagination. They're just kind of... So Virginia Woolf, I think, they, they asked her one time, what are you scared of? And she said, coming down the stairs in the morning. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, because when I come down the stairs, the first thing I do is I sit down at my typewriter and start writing. And it, my typewriter's up against the living room window. It looks out through the neighborhood, you know, and... She said, I never know if I'm going to sit down and start writing and I'm going to be Virginia Woolf, the internationally celebrated you know, novelist and essayist, and, or if I'm going to be a middle-aged woman in a bathrobe looking out a window. <laughs> and every write I try, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, it, it's, you just kind of you go, oh, gosh, well, how's this going to go? And that's not a very healthy way to approach Some, it. But I mean, So sometimes you feel like a middle-aged woman in a bathrobe? Well, don't tell anybody that, but yeah, sometimes, <laughs> that's you know. That's what I gained from That's kind story. of a dream of well, mine. you know what? What excites you about an idea when you're in a co-write? If I hadn't heard it before. Okay. That's what I look for. I look for something I hadn't heard before or an angle I hadn't thought about before. And when those come to me or when somebody across the room from me suggests it, that, that's a that's like a little sip of something good, you know. Yeah. And then you get into it and, and uh, it, it, anything I'm working on I think is good or I wouldn't be working on it. But... When you're on one, you know it's good. There's a, there's just a high that comes with it, and, and I don't, I don't get that as often uh, as I'd like. You know, it, it, it's a. You know, when I was younger, I didn't know what was good. Well, I thought I did, but uh, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing, I've, I've been paid to do this for 30 years. Mm -hmm. it come, come mid-May, and. Uh, it, when I get that feeling, that's why I do it. And, and you know, obviously, we, we I've got, I got a family. I, you know, I like to do fun things. I, I want to make some money, you know. Mm -hmm. But that high is just, it, it's, it's not like any other high. You know, it's like we did this, we made this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, something Love cool. Like there you go. That still makes me happy when I listen to that. Yeah, you know? I love that song too. I do too. So. What kind of person do you write with best? Do you think? Well, I always say that in a co-writing relationship, there uh, there are two skill sets, and some people have both, uh, or some degree thereof. And I, you do. I think that uh, I think I've got both, but I'm way heavy on the. You know, I, I'm pretty good at looking at whether it's an idea or come bring an idea in or whatever. But once we establish the idea, I'm really good at looking at it and 
saying, I know how to say this in a way that is going to make it appeal. And, uh, and, you know, here's, here's a, here's a really fertile patch of ground that I think would have some emotional impact to it. And we'll dig over here and sit over here, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there's other people who, uh, I think are, are almost producers that, you know, uh, they can, they can hear something go, that's good. That's good, but it's not going to work. And I'll tell you why. And, you know, and that, that I do as well, but I don't think I'm, that's my talent. My talent is making stuff. I'm a, I, I would be what they refer to around here as like an artist writer, you know. And uh, I, I look for people who are stronger in that suit. Uh, my buddy George Tarrant, he and I have written, I've written more number ones with George than I have with anybody else. And uh, he's got, he can wear both hats as easily and as comfortably as ever. But when, and I'm more comfortable wearing the artist hat. But when the two of us get together, we'll we'll get there, and I don't even pay attention to who's doing what because we're trading hats so fast. I don't even I don't even know who's wearing mm -hmm. what hat. You know, it just kind of works. It's a chemistry yeah. thing. I've used you as an example, not by name, but when I've t worked with people that are writing, you know, say one of the jobs that you can do in a co-writer a lot of times is be the kind of the editor. And yeah, I feel like when we've written, you know, you will get this creative burst, and you just start taking off, and I'm trying to like. Write down the great things, you know, so that right. so that yeah. we can go back and, and go. These were the these are gold right here. Let's build on that. Yeah, kind of yeah, thing. yeah. That's those are the and that's exactly what I look for in a co-writer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and other people are different. You know, uh, I've written with a lot of guys who they don't they, they might, they'll come with an idea. Kelly Lovelace, he'll tell you he's an idea man. Mm -hmm. And man, when you write with him, it's always fun because I might have an idea, I might not, but I know he's gonna have one. Right, and it's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. You want to hear a story in a song? Yeah. yeah okay, let's do that. If it's good. Well, I don't know if it's any good or not, but this is, I, I play a song, uh, when I was a, when I got to college, you know, n nobody was going to be a songwriter when they graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, and everybody there is asking, what you going to do, what you, what you majoring in? I go, well, right now, music, you know. Oh, oh, you going to teach? I go, nah. What are you going to do? Well, like you're gonna be a concert pianist or something? I said, no. What are you gonna do? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I always wanted to be in music, but it just nobody else was doing. It. I thought, well, maybe maybe nobody does that anymore. I don't know what I was thinking. Decided to go to law school, and my dad started worrying, and uh, mm -hmm. he saved the world from a well, he saved me from a lot of malpractice suits. <laughs> but but uh, uh, he called me one day. He said, there's a guy in Nashville, a guy from Nashville. A woman named Tony Wine who's teaching a class at, at uh, University of Memphis. It's a four-week deal, so once a week, on songwriting. Do you want to do it? And I said, and I'm still writing, but I, 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 what are you talking about? Well, I thought you might be interested. And I said, yeah, I think I do. He said, well, I'll go there with the first one to sign you up. And I was in exams, you know. So uh, I came back for the second one, and I, I met a guy named Chips Moman. His wife was teaching the class, and Chips was a a legendary record producer, guitar player, songwriter. He uh, he says, I'll give you $100 a week to write songs for me. And I was 20 years old. I said, I'll take it. And uh, But he made me promise I'd go back and finish my senior year. You know. So when I went back to school, he called me one day. He said, have you ever heard of the Highway Men? And I said, uh, no. He said, have you ever heard of the Highway Men? I said, oh. He said, you ever heard the song The Highway Man? I said, nope. <laughs> and he says, you really don't like country music, do you? And I said, no, sir. And uh, I can't believe I said that looking back, but I, I, I did, but I wasn't a fan. You know? mm -hmm. He says, go buy The Highway Man and write me the sequel. This will be a good exercise for you. So I went and bought a cassette tape and listened to it, and I wrote what I thought was going to be the sequel. And I played it for him, and he's, he said, that's good. And so he called me a couple weeks later. He says, can you be in Nashville at this address on Monday? I said, sure. And I, I skipped class. I drove up, up here to Nashville, and uh, I went to... Uh, what used to be Emerald Studio, mm -hmm. and uh, which is where we wrote "Love Is Like Rain," I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah, but uh, I walked in and when I opened the door, there's Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson, and I'm like a college kid, you know, a black leather jacket and a, a mullet, you know, <laughs> and uh, they didn't know what to make of me. The room went dead silent, and Chip says, "Rip, play your song for these boys." And I'm looking around, and I look over to my right, and there's Glenn Campbell. And, <laughs> and I had my guitar in my hand, and I said, well, Mr. Campbell, may I borrow your capo? <laughs> and 
I got down on my knee and I played my song and I got finished. Christopherson, he was kind of quiet. Christopherson said, well, hell, that's right up our alley. And that was the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my life, you know. So I, I sang it with their band, you know, and they got the track and Johnny Cash went out to sing his part and he, he, he wouldn't have any trouble. He just was a very classy, cool guy. And he says, hey, kid, why don't you come out here and teach me how to sing this thing? So I got in this little booth with Johnny Cash. I was teaching oh, him how to wow. sing. Yeah, it was crazy. You didn't wet your pants, did you? Well, I don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but when I came in, that's exactly what Waylon Jennings said. He said, hey, kid. He says, were you scared out there in that little room with Johnny Cash? And I was not going to give it up for anybody. I was so scared. I said, there are people. Just be, just be, you're just with a bunch of your buddies at a party. Just just be as normal mm-hmm. as you can be. And I said, no, I wasn't scared. And he looked at me kind of like my dad did, you know. Mm-hmm. He gave me that old once over and he says, shit. <laughs> this was the first song I had recorded. Johnny Cash said, I am a shotgun rider for the San Jacinto Lion. The desert is my brother. My skin is cracked and dry. I was riding on full coach. And everything was fine Till we took a shorter road to save some time The bandits only fine once they shot me in the chest They may have wounded me But they'll never get the best of better men Living dealing cards, my clothes are smooth and honest, but my heart is cold and hard. I was shuffling for some Delta boys on a boat to New Orleans. I was the greatest shark they'd ever seen. But the captain bumped a sand bar and an ace fell from my sleeve. They threw me overboard as I swore I didn't cheat, but I could swim. Make a living off the land. I ride a John Deere tractor. I'm a liberated man. But the rain, it hasn't fallen since the middle of July. And if it don't come soon, my crops will die. The bankman says he likes me, but there's nothing he can do. He tells me that he's coming, but the clouds are coming too. tribe is Cherokee My forefathers loved this land, they left it here for me, but the white men came with boats and trains and his dirty factories and poisoned my existence with his deeds Nature is our mother we are sucklings at her breast and he who tries to beat her will lose her to the rest they'll never win How old when that was recorded? Uh, twenty one. Twenty one. Yeah. Okay. So what's? I mean, where do you go from? Well, those guys cutting your song. It's you been know? a disappointing career. Yeah. <laughs> after that, it's all downhill. <laughs> so, no. What happened after that? Well, uh, I started shopping for 
Connelly Ellis over looking the Mississippi River, thinking I was going to make a million bucks. And uh, I think after about a year, my grand total was about fifteen grand, and that was most of that was for playing on the album. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was a nice. It, I did get a decent royalty check. It was a single. It wasn't. I mean, the, it was five thousand dollars, and I framed it. And I said, nah, I can't frame this. I got to put this money to work. I was <laughs> yeah, just, right. you know. But uh, yeah, it was eight years, a wife, and two children before I had uh, a song recorded again. Wow. Yeah, it was a long, long, strange trip. I did every job I could think of. I wrote jingles. I got a break and, and got somebody who said, I'll pay you $200 to write a jingle for me. You know, I got really fired up about it and then I played it for me. So well, I'll give you another 200 if you'll sing it. It was like a Western sizzling ad. No, oh, really? Yeah, it ran everywhere. But uh, uh, I worked in a plant nursery for a while at agricultural minimum, which is, you know, less than minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, you know, I would pack up my car with all the gear I had, and I'd drive to Birmingham and Jackson, Mississippi, and Oxford, Memphis, and Jackson, Tennessee, and back to Nashville, and I'd, you know, about every six weeks and try to make some money. And uh, it was brutal. It, I moved here in 93 and I got my first publisher deal in 96. Well, when I came here, I was still writing for Chips and I got a record deal quick. I, I'd been here about six months and I got a record deal. and, and uh, But, you know, I got my advance. It wasn't very much. Back mm -hmm. then, they were giving record deals to anybody that was willing to get it. <laughs> you were about walk by. Yeah, exactly. So it was brutal. It's tough. It's yeah. a tough way to make a living. I think a lot of times people don't see the sacrifice. They just see the successful you know things that make the news or you know man I wish I could just knock off the morning and go play golf I've <laughs> yeah. heard that a bunch you yeah know. Well, exactly why don't you uh, why don't you write about 10,000 songs and then move to Nashville and start working and see how it goes for <laughs> right exactly yeah. you know to, to be a, success, a successful songwriter you've got to wrestle you, you wrestle with yourself ah. you wrestle with your beliefs um, yes indeed. you wrestle with insecurity you know and, and that all of those things at the end of the day are what give you the possibility of tomorrow going out and writing a hit song that's you, it because you're you're wrestling with real stuff and you're you're putting that into songs how however pretty or ugly that might be you know and um, that's where the good stuff comes from though yeah when I wrote when I got inspired instead of saying I'm gonna write every day uh, I'd write about 12 songs a year and when I said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get busy on this thing," I still didn't write every day, but I'd write 25. And then when I started co-writing in earnest, it was 125. I mean, the the the, uh, the power of two people versus one mm -hmm. is just that much more effective. It's five times as effective. May you may not get the same kind of song, uh, and I think there are some songs that are you better off just writing by yourself. But it takes a lot longer. It's a lot harder. It's a lot lonelier. Yeah. yeah. A lot more fun to co-write, I think. It's a lot more fun. I like people. A lot less like work. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Check out the show notes. You can find a link to our sponsor, Sweetwater. Sweetwater is the best place to get gear, instruments, all that kind of stuff. You've also got links to some books that Clay and I have written about songwriting and to Songtown itself. Hope you'll check us out. See you soon.